This meeting is being recorded. We're starting, by the way. Chris, just start this with the sound. This meeting is being recorded. I want to hear all of this, this cinema verite shit. And I want everyone to hear me opening my morning Benadryl and popping yeah. pennies before we get started. And waving around <laughs> a knife. <laughs> well, I had to open the Benadryl somehow, Sophie. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's a little knife. This, at this point, both podcast now th- you started off with this one with a knife and the last one with a gun. So well, there's uh, always a gun. I mean, there's yeah. a gun right out right behind me. This like, is I'm just I'm, ex- for us. I'm excited for the next one. The next one, just uh, just keep upping the ante. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to order my uh, my young ward Garrison just found out how to order one of those bolo wraps, which are the things the cops shoot at you now that like wrap around your body and stop you from moving. So I think I'm going to get one of those. <laughs> oh, my God. That it's <laughs> like uh, it just it, it like wraps around you like in yeah, cartoons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, a, yeah, like I, in cartoons. Yes, I didn't know that was a real. <laughs> yeah, weapon. it's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the cops are going to find out how to kill somebody with it soon, but I'm going to buy one just to fuck yeah. around with. Yeah, They've already made them lethal and like yeah. attached like little <laughs> knives at the end of them. There's already kind of little knives, actually, on the things. <laughs> of course there is. Uh, oh, this is, um, for people who don't know, Behind the Bastards podcast, Bad People. I'll tell you all about them. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I woke up feeling like shit. As I was just saying, last night, I had a friend come over and then leave at like 2.30 in the morning. And I had a choice once my friend left. Was I going to go to bed or was I going to buy a bunch of drugs and get fucked up until 4.30 or 5 in the morning and then Mm -hmm. stumble into consciousness to do this podcast hungover? And I chose sobriety and I went to bed sober and I woke up exactly as late as I would have if I had gotten fucked up. And I feel exactly as bad. And the lesson is always do drugs. Yeah, just lesson. say yes. Just say you yes. You say yes to drugs, you know? It's like that yeah. uh, that movie Yes Man. With, yes, exactly, uh, exactly. exactly. One of those. The movie Yes yeah. Man, which contains uh, yeah. all of life's lessons in it. Yeah, really, it's, um, a, it's a great movie about lessons. And uh, wait, Was that one I, of the rapey Jim Carrey movies or not? I actually, to be honest with you, I, I, I've never actually seen it, but I remember yeah, thinking about sense. the plot and going, uh, what if someone offers some heroin? And uh, uh, look, man, then, I mean, that's the movie I no want to, to see. heroin. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah if someone's uh, offering, it's just rude to say no. I mean, I've turned it down when it's been offered in injectable form. But there was this one time in rural India where a guy had a bunch of black tar in his finger and was offering licks. And I absolutely took a lick. Um, yeah. Who's yeah. not going to take a lick of black tar? Who's not going to take under, a lick of a stranger's, underneath a stranger's finger finger heroin <laughs> in the desert? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, well, I got to uh, say yes to this. Yeah. yeah. Matt. So, what's up? How do you feel about the Holocaust? Oh, uh, anti. Anti. Good yep, call. That makes yeah. sense. That's Me a too. good call. That's really the only call with the yeah. Holocaust. Yeah. yeah, not a have fan. You, have you heard of a fellow? Mm-hmm. A dude? A, a, a chaparino? By mm-hmm. the name of Reinhard Heydrich. Reinhard Heydrich. Reinhard uh, Heydrich. Uh, I don't believe I have. I, I, I mean, I, in a way, it's like one of those German names where I'm like, mm-hmm. if you just said it out loud, apropos of nothing, I'd be like, oh, that's that famous Nazi. But I, yeah, I mean, I yes, would... yes, he is a famous Nazi, and you're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, if not, I think ninety percent of people hearing that would be like, he probably did some like Nazi shit back in the probably day, some right? Nazi shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, just real... judging by the context of the the podcast yeah. we're on and that yeah. very German sounding name, but no, I don't think I've heard of him. <laughs> well. He's not just, he is a Nazi, but he's also mm-hmm. the Nazi. Oh, good. So, wow. here on Behind the Bastards, we pretty much exclusively discuss the worst people in history and their horrible crimes. Monsters are sure. our business. So, <laughs> you, Sophie, and you, Matt, and also our regular listeners, will know what it means when I tell you this might be the worst person we ever cover. Oh, great. Oh, fuck. Write <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it Re- us. Reinhard Heydrich is the man who is the architect of the Holocaust. Oh, he shit. is the man Wait. who there were a lot of people who wanted to do a Holocaust. He is yeah. the guy who figured out the nuts and bolts of it. That's who Damn. we're talking about today. He was the most passionate about Holocausting and he yes, figured it absolutely. out. Absolutely. He and he he found that was the niche he chose within the Nazi system. Um and he he made that be his thing, and then eleven wow. million people died. Yeah, um, he's Jesus. he's a pretty bad dude. So fuck <laughs> um, that yeah, guy. Yeah, no, I mean, 
I, I'm anti him. Yeah. You know, like definitely he sounds- anti him. So to give you a little bit of context for this guy before we go into mm-hmm. his life story, he was a Nazi for 11 years. And in that time, mm-hmm. he earned these nicknames. The Hangman, the Butcher of Prague, the Blonde Beast, Himmler's Evil Genius, the Young Evil God of Death, and <laughs> <laughs> Adolf Hitler himself. Adolf Hitler's nickname for Heydrich was the man with the iron heart. That I, I okay. <laughs> so first of all, some of those are like not gonna lie, pretty cool sound they're, they're rapper all names. Pretty badass <laughs> nicknames. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> Which is like the worst thing about Nazis yeah. is their absolute commitment to just style. Yeah. And like, you know, whether it was how they dressed or like the what they named shit, you're just yeah. like, fuck, that's a cool name. I and hate like that a, you're evil. A solid half of those would be really good EPs. Yes. Like if he yes. was a hip hop artist, like fucking you <laughs> see you see a dude's face and the young evil god of death on an album cover. And you're <laughs> like, well, fuck, I got to check this shit out. I, I've literally I've definitely downloaded half of those nicknames yeah. on Napster in the 90s. You know, <laughs> you guys listen to the man with the iron heart. Fucking yeah. rad. <laughs> yeah. um, but he was not. He was a real piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Werner Best, who was a horrible Nazi uh, and was mm-hmm. Heydrich's deputy for many years, called Reinhard Heydrich the most demonic personality in the Nazi leadership and said that he was driven by an inhumanity which took no account of those he mowed down. And again, this is a Nazi saying this. It's like this is Hitler calling him the man with the iron heart. (laughs) And yeah, it's not just like a Nazi saying it. It's like they have Hitler to compare this person to. An alive (laughs) Hitler is right there. This guy looks bad. (laughs) (laughs) Even Hitler's like, damn, dude, tone it down a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, man. (laughs) Peel it back, homie. Yeah. He never said that to him. Yeah, Um, no, of course. No, that's not how Hitler worked. Yeah. Um, now, and I should note that because of all of the Nazis who say horrible things about Heydrich, one thing we should note at the start, and we'll note a couple more times in the episode, is that the Nazis who talked about Heydrich after the war were Nazis who survived and thus had a vested interest in trying to downplay their own complicity and elevate sure. Heydrich's, right? So yeah. we do need to keep that in mind. But still, the fact that not just after the war, during and before the war, other Nazis consistently recognized Heydrich as a terrifying and vile monster <laughs> says a yeah. lot about the man. It's it's uh, honestly, it's impressive in the most disgusting way yeah. that he is. Uh, I mean, the fact that you're calling him like the worst Nazi he, he and, might have Hitler, been. <laughs> yeah. and Hitler's there. And I'm just like, fuck, man. And like, also, you know, shame on me for having never have heard of him you know yeah. was uh, i you know i uh, was he in that movie uh conspiracy did someone play him yes. in that movie? oh yeah you've seen conspiracy yes i he have is, he is the main nazi in conspiracy oh he's that blonde guy yeah he's played the blonde by, guy yes uh that that uh, dude kenneth Branagh. yeah he's played by kenneth Branagh in conspiracy which is a very good movie i think a very good movie about the uh the vance conference yeah no i love um, it i love yeah, that movie yeah he, that's reinhard heydrich um wow yeah And here's the thing about him. When you set him up like that, one expects Heydrich to be almost a force of supernatural evil, like a fucking Wolfenstein Nazi, right? Like he's fucking summoning demons and shit. Right. (laughs) The reality is that every single person listening to this knows at least one person with a personality similar to Reinhard Heydrich's. The most Mm. terrifying thing about this guy is that he was not a super anti-Semitic dude from the start. He was not a super committed Nazi from the start. His evil grew from the most mundane seed possible. He wanted to be a big man. Uh, That's all. That's all. This is not a guy. This is not like Hitler. Hitler, this is a dude who has like fucking demonic dreams from a very early age. These dreams of of conquest and violence against his enemies. He follows Mm -hmm. a decades long plan to achieve them. That's not Reinhard Heydrich. Heydrich is a guy who wants to be uh, important and respected And that and he was like, what's to the- plan the Holocaust? Yeah, right. He was like, all right, well, what's like what's trending right now? What's the one exactly. thing I can talk exactly. about that everyone's going to be into? Yeah. Oh, hating the Jews. I could do that. And then he yeah. just pivots to hating Jews. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a little well, I mean, we're about to talk about it right now. So let's get into it. Reinhard yeah. Tristan Eugen Heydrich was born on March 7th, 1904 in the city of Halle in Prussia. 
His name was picked by his father, Bruno Heydrich, who was a composer and an opera singer of modest success and notoriety. Bruno's first opera was Amen, which debuted in 1895 to significant critical acclaim. The central conflict in the opera is between Thomas, a peasant leader who re- represents the rise of social democracy in Germany. Thomas is the bad guy. Um, and <laughs> the course. hero is Reinhard, a nobleman, mm-hmm. a heroic nobleman of fine breeding and traditional aristocratic German values. Reinhardt is murdered by Thomas at the end of the play, and since Thomas is a devious cripple, he has to stab Reinhardt in the back to kill him. The fact that Bruno Heydrich named his son after the protagonist of this opera is telling, as is the fact that the plot of this 1895 opera very much mirrors the right wing reaction to Germany's defeat in World War One. It's the stabbed in the back myth, right? Like this. Yeah, idea right, go- right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, and also it's like uh I mean, props to having commitment to just hating like the peasant class and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Oh, my I mean, God. For sure. It's just, it's just like in any other like context, like well, when is like the noble lord, you know, is the hero of this? Just, I, I, I would say it's it's not because there's, I think, an element in this guy's work of actually like deifying the peasant class, but the peasant class when they know their place. Right. Right. Of this course, is like a of hatred course. of the peasants who want, you know, to not be yeah. ground under the feet of the lords. It, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. People just, yeah. you know, opera singing about getting the boot off their neck and then lords yeah. being like, nah, bro, stay, yeah. stay there. Bruno is a monarchist. Um, he's not a fascist. He's a he's a monarchist. Um, he would mm-hmm. have been a fascist if if that had really been coming up in his time. But he was, you know, right. just a, a big supporter and didn't like the idea that there would be any kind of democracy. And Germany was prior to World War One. There were large democratic elements, right? The Kaiser mm-hmm. is not as absolute an autocrat as, for example, the czar. Right. Um, yeah. So most of the sources I've come across online about Reinhardt tend to fall into the same traps when describing his childhood. Because he was such a monster as an adult, they seem to have a need to sow the seeds of that evil in it with a particularly vicious upbringing to claim that, like, oh, there was there was something in his background that made it clear he was going to do this. And I'm going right, to quote they're an trying example. To, yeah, they're, they're trying to backwards. Cruella him. You yeah, know? exactly. They, they, yeah, make, they, make, <laughs> they want to make a bunch of uh, Dalmatians push his mom <laughs> off the roof or something, you know. That's one of but, the silliest things. Like, I would have thought that that was, like, somebody, like, fucking with me <laughs> no. as opposed to that being in an actual movie. Oh, it's very real. Yeah. It's very real. <clears throat> yep. I want to quote, in order to give you an idea of how his background is usually kind of summarized when you, like, read, you, you Google Reinhard Heydrich and read an article about him. Here's a mm-hmm. quote from an article from War History Online about him. His father, Bruno, was a non-religious singer and composer who was kept out of the upper echelons of German society due to a humble background and a persistent, though false, rumor that he was Jewish. Reinhard's mother, Elisabeth Kranz, was a practicing Catholic from a rich musical family in Dresden. As Reinhard grew up, both his father and his classmates inculcated him with a virulent anti-Semitism. He was a loner who tried to prove his superiority through his studies and through sports. This is largely wrong, or at least incomplete. Um, yeah. It is true that there were rumors that Bruno had Jewish ancestry. These were false. Uh, and while they were a semi-regular annoyance for Bruno, they had no impact on his success. So Reinhardt's mm. dad grew up destitute due to the fact that Bruno's father had died early. Um, and Bruno was actually a pretty incredible guy. He was like, as a child, the breadwinner for his entire family. And he had to teach his younger siblings. Um, mm. And despite their desperate financial decision, as a young adult, he made the decision to strike out uh, and have a career as a professional musician which was not a common thing to be able to do at that point in time. It was very unlikely that he would succeed at this, but he did yeah. with no money, uh, no family money and no family connections, which speaks to his talent and dedication. The yeah. idea that the Heydrich family was kept out of the upper echelons of German society is entirely false. Reinhard's mother, Elizabeth, came from a very wealthy family, and the fact that they were willing to marry her off to Bruno speaks to how successful and respected he was. He was a local celebrity and a significant one. Um, yeah. Because his son became a monster, there's a trend among people writing about the Hydrics to dismiss Bruno as like a second rate musician and composer and be like, well, he yeah. was never very successful. And, you know, maybe that came off on his kid and this like frustration. They love this origin story. Yeah. They love the origin story of like yeah. uh, failed artist goes Nazi. Yeah. And, uh, you know, or like, you know, is progeny goes Nazi yeah. or failed artist who everyone said it had like 
low key Jewish ancestry. They always add that too because I've heard that with Hitler. I mean, it, it heard- is a. Th- I mean, it's a thing. Both for there's rumors both for Hitler and for Heydrich, and for Heydrich, yeah. it's a more significant thing. But it's not. It's not a thing that like stops his his dad from doing anything for sure. It doesn't yeah, stop no, Heydrich I think it's, either. Yeah, I think it's just a, a slur that people used to do on the playgrounds back in the day. Yeah, Everyone exactly, is just like, yes. ah, he's a secret Jew. You yeah. know. Everyone at one point got a se- called a secret Jew back in those it's days. It's not yeah. uncommon. Um, it's not uncommon. And the more important thing to note is that, like, Bruno Heydrich was not a second-rate musician and composer. He was extremely well-respected in his time. Mm. Uh, he was even yeah. invited to join the Hall of Freemason Lodge, which he duly did, which means if you're being invited to join the Freemasons, you're in the upper crust in the yeah, 18, like no. early, yeah, eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, they had uh, um, very strict guidelines for yes. who they would let in to be a Mason. Yeah, and it also is not true, does not seem to be true that Heydrich was a loner who tried to prove his superiority through studies and sports, at least not to any extent that was unusual at the time. He was mostly raised by his mother and governess while his father devoted his life to work, and this was very common for the time. It would not have raised eyes as an upbringing. I think people just hate the idea of... uh, people who commit evil acts being in any way ordinary. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they need to have some extraordinary origin story so that you can feel better about the fact that, you know, whatever your horrible beliefs are, you're like, well, at least I would never go as far as yeah. that person. They need like, to nah. be evil and unredeemable from the beginning. So for example, right. Hitler can't have been a guy who as a young man, near destitute when he got his inheritance from his mother, handed all of that money to his sister because she was a young mother in a a truly selfless gesture of love because Hitler can't have done a selfless gesture of love. Right. Because it's much more frightening if he did. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, shit, that means anyone could be a Hitler? No, I don't like that. (laughs) I don't like that one bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, the so Bruno was so successful that not only like I mean his 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 kind of his his playwriting or opera writing kind of career eventually did level off. There was a point at which he stopped. You know, they stopped doing as well. But he also yeah. started a music school, a conservatory, which was extremely successful. And the family gets fucking rich off of this conservatory. So, again, Damn. not exactly frustrated ambitions no. here. He's no, about as of, successful as a musician can be in this period. Yeah, kind of crushing it. Yeah. It seems like uh, everything should be going fine for yep. them and no one should turn Nazi. And as the oldest son in the family, Reinhard was expected to inherit his father's music school. Um, And as a result, most of his early childhood was devoted to preparing him for this task. Uh, Reinhard received constant rigorous musical training from early childhood on. Before he started primary school at age six in 1910, he knew musical notation and he could play the piano. Yeah, that'll do it. Yep. That'll (laughs) do it right there. You teach a kid piano. Honestly, if mm-hmm. you uh, if you've ever been a kid taking piano lessons, after a while mm-hmm. you just are like, I'm going to commit atrocity. Oh yeah, I, I mean, hate this. I mean, so I, much. I, I'll tell you honestly, most of why I carry a gun is that if I ever see a piano, I'm just going <laughs> to dump the mag into that fucking thing. If I see one goddamn piano, <laughs> I see teacher. a fucking piano in this house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Can't stand it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it, but th- like the fact is actually like you could hear this background to be like, oh, maybe he um he didn't like being pressured into music. He fucking loves music. Um, he loves yeah. music his whole life. He's very good. Uh, he starts violin lessons at age six. For everything we know, he seems to have been extremely enthusiastic about that path in life. Huh. Um, his mother Elizabeth was raised Catholic. Um, and the I think the like the family kind of went with her family religion, and this did make her and later Reinhard members of a minority in Germany. Catholics were about thirty six percent of the German population. This is a Protestant country, right? Martin Luther, the guy who right. makes Protestantism be a thing, is a German. Germany is a Protestant nation. Catholics right. are a large minority, but they're a minority. Um, and this was like kind of the time that Reinhardt is being raised, and his family's very Catholic. Like he's an altar boy as a kid. And yeah. this was a period of time in which a lot of Catholics in Germany were starting to assert themselves as Germans first and Catholics second, because there were a lot of conspiracy theories and like bigotry right. against Catholics, right? That, oh, you're loyal to the Pope, not to the Kaiser, right? right? And this yeah, is the yeah, thing yeah. fucking JFK has to deal right. with that, but like, like in like the 60s and shit. I, I saw <laughs> someone do that with Biden recently yeah, on Twitter. <laughs> I was just like, what the fuck is yeah. wrong? Like, are we bringing popes that? Popes aren't even loyal to popes anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's like two living popes right yeah. now hanging out. <laughs> Nobody cares. I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so yeah, this is like so this is like a thing that's happening in Germany at the time, and the Heydrichs bucked this trend. Like, right? I'm not. I don't think they were like saying that we're loyal to the Pope over Germany, but they right, stayed right, right. extremely pious. They were consistent mass attendees, and their mm-hmm. religiosity stands out particularly when con- contrasted with the fact that the early 1900s in Germany is a time of rapidly increasing secularism. Church attendance rates were dropping dramatically during this period, and the fall was most notable among Protestants, but it was significant for Catholics too. We'd be speculating to say what impact this had on young Heydrich, but it is worth noting also that 94% of his city was Protestant. So he grew up in a devoted religious minority, and that's kind of worth noting. Yeah. Now, one of the most significant things about Reinhardt as a child is that he was weak and sickly. And I'm going to quote from the book Hitler's Hangman by Robert Gerwath here. Quote, as a child of slender and relatively small stature with a weak constitution and a susceptibility to illness, Reinhard was encouraged by his parents to take up every kind of physical exercise from an early age. Swimming, running, football, sailing, horse riding, and fencing. Heydrich's lifelong passion for sport began here. The family's summer vacations were usually spent on the picturesque coast of the Baltic Sea in the swanky seaside town of Swinemunde on the island of Usedom. For the Heydrich children, this was surely the most exciting time of the year. They spent their holiday sightseeing, taking walks and enjoying boat excursions and days on the beach i'm so pissed because these guys they have really great instagram lives yeah and and i just uh well you know crushed it on the gram the hydrix early I 1900s just, <laughs> yeah dude they would they would be they'd have a fucking tlc show about them they would yeah. god it's just it <laughs> pisses me off man like why are these the people who do holocausting it's just oh man yeah Evil, evil, evil fucking like entitled rich kids who, uh, you know, fucking, I don't know, blame the Jews for no goddamn reason. Yeah, we'll get into why. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. And again, it is worth noting that at this point in his early childhood, pre-World War One, this is a kid who by all accounts, like he's got some health problems, but he seems to be having a good upbringing. There's like yeah. no reports of him picking apart flies or torturing animals. Yep, and there's none yep. of the stuff we have for Hitler either. These stories about him going on these bizarre unhinged rants or threatening suicide and murder. His mm-hmm. family was successful. He was gifted. Um, and when he grew older, it was decided that he would go to secondary school. Now, only about 10% of boys got to do this at the time. Most adolescents went kind of right into like learning a trade after primary school. The school that about 10% of boys like actually went to secondary school. The school that Reinhardt's parents picked for him was also unique. It was called the Reform Gymnasium, and it was a new sort of institution in Germany that was focused on the scientific optimism at the time. And unlike about 90% of German schools in this period, secondary schools are religious schools, either Catholic or Protestant. I assume there's some Jewish ones in there. Um, Mm -hmm. But this is the Reform Gymnasium is a religious. So he doesn't have a strong like when he starts getting his education, there's no religious bent to the education in his secondary school. So he had like a secular, uh, secular schooling. Yeah, which like, is rare for yeah. the time. Yeah, Reform yeah. gymnasium is yeah. like a bad... It's all one word in German. I don't know. Yeah. Just sounds yeah. bad time. Yeah, they I used mean, the word gymnasium yeah. a lot back in the Why? day. Why? I don't know, Sophie. I don't know. It, they were wrong I, about everything. It was the old times. <laughs> they just made up the word gymnasium and applied yeah. it to anything. Oh, that's a great and, word. <laughs> Reform gymnasium <laughs> gonna... just sounds like a Pilates class where you get bullied. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there was a gymnasium in my reformed temple growing up, but I don't believe that was a reformed gymnasium. Yeah. So separate things. Separate, separate. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Reinhard thrived at school, uh, at secondary school. His grades were particularly good in math and science, and his first ambition was to become a chemist. He also did well in languages, and he fell in love with reading. He developed a special fondness for detective and spy novels. Now, most of these novels that he loved as a kid had their origins in the United States or Great Britain. He, uh, he loved Nat Pinkerton novels, which were written by the fucking Pinkerton guy. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He also <laughs> loved Sherlock Holmes, uh, and he would be a lifelong devotee of the detective novel genre. Hmm. When Reinhardt was 10 years old, World War I did its thing. Uh, he was a member of Germany's most awkward generation, and as a result, the generation that produced some of the very worst Nazis. So Reinhardt, like Heinrich Himmler, was too young to go to the front and fight as a soldier, but old enough that he was fully conscious of the war and fully right. conscious of all this propaganda idolizing the front generation. So he's right. extremely kind of like spends his adolescence hoping to get to fight, but he never does because, you know, it doesn't, war doesn't go great for Germany. 
Um, yeah, 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 yeah. They uh, they lose that one. Yeah, and then uh, they lose their uh, their precious Kaiser. They do lose their precious Kaiser. He goes off yeah. to fucking uh, the Netherlands to <laughs> chop wood. Fucking weirdo. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, this war was a like it, you know I, as far as I can tell, none of the Hydrics or their close relatives died fighting in World War One. I. I mean, I'm sure mm. they had some relatives who died, but I haven't run across it, so it must not have been anyone who was super close to the family. But it yeah. was a disaster for the family. Um, the war brought blockades from the British, uh, which caused rationing and an economic collapse that cut the feet out from under Bruno's music conservatory. Now, mm. you could say the Heydrichs were still lucky within kind of the majority of the German population. Like a million Germans starved to death as a result right. of the British blockade. None of yeah. the Heydrichs starve. But... They don't get to enjoy the kind of foods they had before the war. They're definitely hungrier. Like, for an example of how bad this is nationwide, um, bread rationing starts in 1915. Meat rationing starts in 1916. Uh, and by 1916, so the pre-war average daily diet of a German citizen had been 25 calories. It's about 1,200 by 1916. Um so it they they suffer like everyone else, and while they're wealthy enough to avoid starving to death, the war chips away at the family income and erodes their fortune. Uh, their vacations become a lot less fancy. Um, now, obviously, <laughs> they're still on vacation. They're still but, doing yeah. vacations. They still live in a mansion, yeah. but they're not. Yeah. They don't have as we much. Can't nice stay, shit. We can't stay on the shore of the Baltic. We cannot we stay, stay on stay, the shore. We, we, we must have be to in stay London. in a flat inside the city, but yeah. it's only a forty-five minute drive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a beautiful drive to the Baltic. <laughs> Why are you complaining? <laughs> <laughs> so the worst thing that happened to the, um, and I, uh, this must have been a miserable time, but from what we can tell, kind of Reinhard does not seem to have suffered unduly during the war, particularly compared to most people. And sure. in fact, the worst thing to happen to the Heydrich family during World War I um, was not the fact that was not any of the dying like this happens in 1916, which is also a year in which the German army throws a million lives into the meat grinder at Verdun. And right, that right. Year, the Heydrich family's tragedy is that they're, they're obsessed with this upcoming release of a new ab- edition of Hugo Ryman's music lexicon, which is the most popular German encyclopedia of music and musicians. And they were yeah. really excited because Bruno Heydrich was supposed to show up in the volume. He was going to get his own little entry in this music oh. lexicon. And he does. But here's the great tragedy for the Hydrix. They uh-huh. list him as a Jewish composer. Oh, oh snap. Oh, yeah. That really oh. pisses him off. Yeah. God damn, dude. That yeah. is. Woo. And it, it seems to have been that like a former student of Bruno's that he had a falling out with got hired by this and like inserted <laughs> the clip like to fuck with him. <laughs> like nobody like knew it wasn't true. Just wanted to f- like exactly. It's like you said, it's a playground insult. So this oh guy my. Who doesn't like him works for the company and sticks it in the encyclopedia. He does a fucking fuck prank. Yeah. 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 That's like, that's like finding out that fucking Ashton Kutcher accidentally did the Holocaust. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I was just fucking with him. I was now trying to punk him. them. <laughs> I was doing punk. I, uh, oh man, that yeah. sucks. <laughs> so uh, Bruno sues the encyclopedia for libel and he wins the case uh-huh. and they fix the encyclopedia. But rumors about their, the family's Jewish ancestry grow more frequent after this. And Reinhard's schoolmates begin to tease him and his younger brother. Now, that quote I read earlier and a lot of summaries of Heydrich's upbringing will note that his family was extremely anti-Semitic. And this is something that seems like it would have to be undeniable given his future. But his right. biographer, Robert Gerwath, argues that there's no evidence of this, um, which is not to say that they weren't anti-Semitic. But that's not the question. The question is, were they anti-Semitic in any way that kind of exceeded the background level of anti-Semitism in German right. Catholic Protestant R- culture? And yeah, no, yeah, probably yeah. not. Uh, I'm yeah. going to quote from Robert Gerwath here. Throughout the war years, the Hydrix placed a great deal of importance on denying these rumors, threatening those who repeated them with libel actions. Yet their own personal relations with the Jewish citizens of Halle, who numbered no more than 1,400 in 1910, were quite normal, and there is no evidence to suggest that Bruno Hydrix's attitude towards the Jews was hostile. On the contrary, Jews sent their sons and daughters to Hydrix's conservatory. Bruno right. rented out the cellar of the school as a storage space to a local Jewish salesman, and his eldest son, Reinhardt, became friends with the son of the cantor of the Halle Jewish community. Community, Abraham Lichtenstein. So again, yeah. Reinhardt has a Jewish friend as a kid. Yeah. The family's yeah. willing to sell and like do business with them. They're right. not. They're not particularly hateful to Ju- their Jewish citizens, right? And Jewish people to them aren't some like 
weird foreign abstraction. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not the community. like yeah, yeah, yeah. They know them. They know Jews. They they've talked to Jews. They're friends with Jews. They work with them. Uh, yeah, wow. it's more the reason they react so violently to these rumors is that it's. Uh, it, again, it's a very racist society. The rumors are bad for business. It's bad for the right. family honor. Like that's the right. reaction. They're not unwilling. Like they don't treat Jewish people like they're some alien culture. They just right. Ha- but they also they're a part of this very racist culture, and they don't right. want to have the consequences of being seen as Jewish. Right. Yeah. Um, they're like not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't think they're I even have... saying that. Like no, again, I'm not, not trying to whitewash it either. But it's not like they're not like <laughs> they're not like laser targeted on being racist. Like they're right, right. Pretty normal and perhaps even for the standards of the time, a little bit more enlightened than a lot of their fellow neighbors. Right. Like yeah, you know who <laughs> also isn't more anti-Semitic than the background level of the culture sophie i think <laughs> probably that's not a good it's idea not working no I um like that one. oh boy uh sophie can you play me out like hopefully. an air horn or three no i'm just gonna say hopefully it's a volkswagen ad because yeah. <laughs> if it's a volkswagen ad <laughs> then it is a bit more anti-semitic than the background level <laughs> yeah. Ah, we're back. And we're thinking about what a completely unproblematic and positive brand Volkswagen is. Volkswagen, the cars that never did anything evil. (laughs) Perfectly good car. Everything it's associated with, normal Mm -hmm. and fun. Volkswagen, starting in 1946, a cool and fun brand. (laughs) <laughs> Volkswagen. Volkswagen remember think- the bug <laughs> yeah. that was nice it had flowers uh, Volkswagen. on it don't think too much about the meaning of the word Volk <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, I love that they totally just uh they they, they KFC their name yeah where they, they were like uh, uh, VW <laughs> VW, yeah, it's a VW. It. yeah if BMW can exist then fucking mm-hmm. VW can Volk just means people, literally just people. Nothing mm-hmm. more can be read into the meaning of the word Volk. Mm-hmm. Never meant anything but yeah. this nor- perfectly normal word people. All it's people. a car. It's a car, Volks. It's, it's a car. car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. A lot of, I think if there's any excuse for kind of bigoted German accents, it's this episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, I feel like the German people love when an American does yeah, an accent. There's you, yeah. you, there's a couple of different groups around the world that you can always make fun of. Americans are one of them, obviously. Mm-hmm. Russians are another. Uh, and then there's mm-hmm. the Germans and the Italians. Uh, oh, and the British. The Italians for sure. Oh, oh yeah. God. The Italians. Oh. I mean, that's uh, my, my entire Sopranos podcast is just, you know, two mm-hmm. dudes doing real bad Italian accents. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you like that. <laughs> Check it out. Someone's going to be That's the legacy of imperialism. Like the only downside you face as an imperial country is it's 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 fine to make fun of your accents and hand gestures forever. Yeah. 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 You lose yeah. one thing. Big fucking deal. You lose one thing. Yeah. We're going to we're going to yeah, yeah. make fun of your fucking pizzas. We're um, going to make fun of your accent. Mm-hmm. Deal with it. So when the war ended, Reinhard was 15, which was more or less a young adult by the standards of his time. He's like 14 when it ends, but like 15 when kind of like it starts to everything. Because there's like, you know, it's it's not a super clean end. Um, Now, German defeat was followed by a wave of protests and a number of left wing revolutions in Germany. And this seems to be what really politicized Heydrich for the first time. He joined the German Nationalist People's Party, which was an anti-democratic monarchist organization in 1919. And in February of that year, a group of miners in Halle proclaimed a general strike against the Reich government. This was met by an anti-communist counter-strike. Businesses in Halle closed to deny strikers food. Doctors, teachers, and other civil servants refused to work. And this was, again, they were striking against the strike. So this is a right. left-wing strike, and there's a right-wing strike against the left-wing strike. I love um, that. Like a, a, a left-wing strike is when the workers get together and decide to make demands upon uh, their employers and a right wing strike is when uh, the <laughs> the cabal of rich people who control everything decide to starve the people. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you can see who has the power there. You know, 
<laughs> yeah, like, it's the it's the starving workers. Yeah, the the the, the left wing mob, the cancel culture came for the yeah, right. It's, it's exactly it's those damn Antifa. They're trying to yeah. cancel Germany just because of World War One. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so the strike grew uh, despite the counter strike. Three quarters of the mines across Germany eventually closed, and in Halle alone, fifty thousand workers gathered to demand the resignation of the Reich government. The defense minister ordered a Freikorps unit, which is like Freikorps are it's like the Oath Keepers. They're veteran, but like scarier because like the Oath Keepers, they all they claim they're veterans. Like eighty percent right. of them either didn't f- do anything in the military at all, or were like a guy whose job was to like sign for the bullets that real soldiers used. Right. Fry Corps guys are like, these guys have just gotten off of the front where their job was to beat people to death in a trench with a wooden club. Like they're scary people. I love <laughs> that the Oath Keepers are like, half of them are just stealing valor. It's like, they that's absolutely amazing. Are. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. But like, these Fry they, Corps they, dudes are, yeah. are some of the most terrifying men who have ever lived. Uh, and the defense sure. minister of Germany orders a Freikorps unit into the city to smash the strike. The whole situation mm. ends in a bloody invasion with several days of insurgent combat in the city. Artillery was used to blast out leftists hiding in buildings. In total, 29 people were killed and 67 were wounded. And shit like this is not just happening. This is happening all over Germany. There's a bunch of different like attempts to take over cities and larger chunks of the government and like fights between right and left. Um, and by comparison to other cities, there Rebellion in Kala is not like one of the the most noted ones. Um, Mm. Reinhard Heydrich was distinctly on the fringes of this developing history. He joined a voluntary civil defense force, which was established by the Freikorps after they killed all the leftists in order to maintain order uh, in case the left tried something again. And he's unlikely to have done anything meaningful. Odds are his joining was more or less a symbolic gesture, a way of asserting his manhood after missing out on the excitement of a real war. Right Now, that's 1919, 1920. There's another quasi-rebellion in Halle. This one is a putsch by a far-right German nationalist party, and this too was defeated. And its defeat brought about another left-wing attempt to take power, right? This is a collapsing fucking empire here, right? So right. You, you have yeah. all these political sides who had been kind of pushed down in terms of their ability to fuck with each other by sort of the Kaiser's, you know, in charge. The Kaiser goes, right. everything collapses, and they just, there's a couple of years where they're just kind of murdering each other in the streets. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's like, it, it, so it, I, it's just such a, a strange impulse to like try to defend your fucking phantom limb of a monarch, you yeah. know, where you're just like, that's gone, dude. Time to time to move on. Yeah, like, that no. dude bounced. He's living in a mansion now. <laughs> yeah, the war right. went bad. <laughs> He's gone. Your and mom starved still... to death and he never missed a meal. Why are you such a fucking bootlicker? <laughs> yeah. It's like, imagine licking a phantom limb. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, that's insane. Like the fucking boot is gone and you're still mm-hmm. licking it. Crazy. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. So there, there's, you know, a series of street battles um, and Heydrich remains in the civil defense forces in 1920. Um, mm-hmm. But there's no evidence that he fought during any of this. He had by this time developed what one friend called, quote, an extremely volkish attitude towards politics. And this means mm-hmm. that he thought this is like the the proto-fascist strain of ideology in Germany, volkish thought. And this yeah. basically, to sum it up, Volkish thinkers thought that the health of the Volk or the German people, generally the Aryan German people, right, right, took precedence over any other concerns, including petty morality. Obviously, there's a lot of racism, anti-Semitism wrapped up in this. Um, again, see see the Volkswagen for more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Heydrich later claimed that during this time he joined several of the racist and pro-Aryan societies that sprang up in Halle, Ger- and all, all across Germany during this period. Mm-hmm. This was probably a lie that he told later to burnish his Nazi credentials. There's mm-hmm. no evidence that he joined any of these anti-Semitic societies in 1920. Um, and the fact is that Reinhard Heydrich, while he was definitely kind of on the right wing side of things, does not seem to have been primarily motivated by politics during this period. In fact, his his, his larger aspirations seem to have been a belief in himself and a desire to be respected. What is mm. important about the politics of the period in terms of Reinhard is that he came of age in an era in which increasingly people who were very political were expressing their willingness and displaying their willingness to do of a, a, a violence against their political enemies. That was right. increasingly common when he's a young man. And that's really the he, biggest impulse impact this has on him at the time. 
Yeah, trying to trying to prove themselves in the eyes of their uh, yeah. fucking sociopathic, psychopathic peers, and just yeah. uh, being willing and to and do. And they're fucking war violence. traumatized peers, right? One of the reasons yeah. Germany is there's so much murdering over politics in this period is that, like, if you've wa- some of these guys have literally seen tens of thousands of people die in front oh, yeah. of their eyes. They've stepped yeah. over the corpses of their schoolmates, blasted yeah. apart by artillery. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, they just don't have any fucks to give, right? <laughs> like, yeah, why would yeah. you not murder somebody if you've been through that? What, what would yeah, it you mean sp- to you? You yeah. spend like 24 hours at Verdun and you're going to mm-hmm. be like, oh, people dying is, that's yeah. normal shit. I could, yeah. I could do that all day. Yeah. It just doesn't yeah. mean the same thing. And by right. the time Reinhardt was 18, the German economy was entering a period of hyperinflation that entirely wiped out the savings of the middle class and the upper middle class. By this point, the Heydrich family was in this category. They had been very wealthy. They had had a mansion. They lose their mansion at some point. They lose their money. The conservatory doesn't quite close for a while, but it's barely hanging on there. And it's reduced to begging for government funds to stay open. This yeah. much must have like rankled Reinhardt. Like he, he's again, he grows up up with money he grows up proud of his family and the fact that his family business collapses because again he loves music it seems like that's a thing he actually would have number one everyone seems to agree he was a very good violin player he was a very talented musician but the fact that his family business collapses the fact that there's no money in teaching music or even really playing it in this period convinces him to pick a different career from his father and in 1922 he joins the navy uh yes yeah, that's good. Never so a good learn- idea. Don't yeah, join the yeah, Navy yeah. Kids. Yeah, just uh, try to avoid uh, any uh, state armed forces at all fucking costs. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, Reinhardt had spent most of his life up to this point living under the Kaiser, and Wilhelm II had been absolutely obsessed with the Navy. Again, Wilhelm is like sees himself in a lot of ways as a British man, and he is. He's like a he's like a grandson of Queen Victoria. Um, of course, Ka- Kaiser Wilhelm is an admiral in the British Navy. Yeah, um, <laughs> like, um, and he's he. He's very obsessed with the Navy. He has this kind of unhinged need. He has both this love of British culture and this kind of unhinged need to to beat the British. And mm-hmm. prior, uh, one of the things that leads to World War I, one of the factors, mm-hmm. is that he's obsessed with building up the German Navy to a, a point that it threatens the British Navy. And this is part of like why tensions escalate. Um, right. But the impact of this for a kid like Reinhardt growing up as a child during this period is that there's a ton of propaganda about how fucking cool it is to be in the Navy. Yeah, yeah. So this Look is at all these giant giant ships look at these giant boats yeah you could hang out with all these dudes you could listen to music and rock and roll which hasn't been invented (laughs) yet you could eat all sorts of chocolates on the sea it's a lot of chocolate yes you could oh you're going to have a great time Mm -hmm. here in the navy we maybe kills you for the kaiser i don't know we will probably throw you uh into a war uh with no real with no real, uh, ob- you know, uh, objective other than a land grab, but it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the November Revolution in that, and and so there's uh, being a, a Navy man becomes complicated after the war because at the very end of World War One, there's this thing called the November Revolution, which helps right. end the Kaiser's government, and it starts with a bunch of sailors in Kiel, which is a mm. port city, refusing the orders of their superior officers to put the imperial fleet out to sea to engage in a last apocalyptic battle with the Royal Navy. So the whole of World War One, pretty much, Germany has a navy that is on paper um, – might be able to beat the Royal Navy, um, but the Kaiser is terrified of risking it, right? Because if you, right. if you try to beat the, you might lose. Uh, yeah. And then you'd lose this beautiful Navy that you're so proud of. So he only <laughs> ever lets it have, there's only one in all of World War I, one full clash between the German and Royal and, and British navies. And they both kind of claim victory. I think you could kind of argue the Germans did a bit better than the British, but it's really not clear. But they have mm-hmm. this, it, it's very b- brutal for both of them. And so after that, they stay in port pretty much the whole fucking time. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the war, it becomes clear they're going to lose. The British are going to like try to take all of the boats from them as part of the surrender agreement. Mm-hmm. And the admiral of the German navy and the Kaiser, I think, also kind of just want the Navy to sail out for one last glorious, just to see if they could beat the Royal <laughs> yeah. Navy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. sailors are like, well, but the war is lost. Why do? We, why are we going yeah. to die for this if, we're, if the yeah. war is lost? I'm just doing an experiment. Just yeah. go out there and see if we can see. win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's called a fucking Hail Mary. Have you ever <laughs> fucking heard of it? Yeah. 
Yeah. So they don't do the Hail Mary. Instead, no. they revolt, which is rad. Um, yeah, that, good, on the German, that good on the, the enlisted men of the German Navy yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, but this kind of among assholes ruins the reputation of the Navy, right? Like sure. if you if you don't suck, you, this would make the Navy seem cooler. Like, yeah, fuck yeah. dying pointlessly for the Kaiser, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. dumbest man in Europe. <laughs> um, but this fucks up their reputation to people who are like shitty nationalists. Now, yeah. the Navy Navy's reputation is saved after the fact that after the Treaty of Versailles, when you know the British is supposed to be given basically most of, of this German Navy that remains, German sailor, sailors heroically destroy their own Navy at Scapa Flow rather than hand it over to Great Britain. So it's yeah. been a complicated period of time yeah. for the Navy. When Reinhardt right. joins the Navy, it's number one, vastly reduced from its previous size, mm-hmm. and it's it's a complicated thing to be in. Now yeah. Reinhard likely joined the Navy because in his childhood, Navy men had had a reputation for being dashing, capable, heroic, and sexy. He wanted mm-hmm. the respect that came with being an officer and the steady paycheck that the military provided because, again, the whole economy's fucking collapsed. The whole country's in, in free fall at this point. Yeah. And by all accounts, Heydrich did very well at training. He was even sent to officer training straight away in 1924 after becoming a senior midshipman. Now, after World War II, some of the guys who'd been Reinhardt's comrades during this period would claim later that he, quote, had no friends among the crew. And mm. again, they're trying to distance themselves from the Holocaust right. guy. Yeah, but also, yeah, yeah. This is pretty consistent, and it's it was probably accurate. And a lot of the claims made about him in this period, um, like <clears throat> it, it's easy to overextend it. That oh, he had no friends because there's something wrong with him. Like from the beginning, people could tell that he was he was just bad. That's not the truth. This is a class thing. And his biographer Robert Gerwath um, credits the fact that he was a loner in the Navy to his, and he was particularly a loner when he's before he's an officer in the period early on in his Navy career. And Gerwath says this is because he's from an, an upper middle class educated background, and he's like he's too fancy for the enlisted Navy guys. He spends his time off duty playing the violin on board and people make fun of him for this. Like that's why he's a loner. The German <laughs> Navy, particularly like, you know, at the midshipman level is this hyper masculine world. And Heydrich is this urbane effete, like a uh, uh, violin uh, player. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Violin yeah. player. They yeah. see him as a pansy. Gerloth yeah. writes, quote, his musical inclinations repeatedly made him the target of ridicule. During his basic training in Kiel, for example, a non-commissioned training officer from West Prussia frequently woke him at night and forced him to play the Teselli Serenade on his serenade on his violin. Many years later, Heydrich recalled these humiliating incidents when making condescending comments regarding the racial inferiority of the West Prussians with their Polish-infested blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, lo- I love uh esoteric race hate <laughs> of the day it's just like oh you yeah. know those goddamn Fucking west, west prussians. prussians yeah uh, everyone are- else it's just another kind of german but you're like no yeah. they're infested with polish blood <laughs> yeah they got a little bit of pole in them yeah. you don't want any of that gross it's now, like uh, they're yeah. they're a quarter slav yeah like all right <laughs> Northern Italy, they're basically Swiss. <laughs> Southern Italy, those are Libyans. Yeah. Uh, so Reinhardt's early years in the Navy included a number of assassinations of liberal politicians by right-wing extremists, including the murder of Foreign Minister Rathenau by one of Heydrich's fellow naval cadets, a guy he goes to Navy school with. Now, mm. despite the fact that he was in close proximity with a right-wing terrorist who assassinated a government minister, Reinhardt exhibited no interest in this case. Like, again, he's not political at this point. He, he's like, a, you know, he doesn't give a shit about this. Uh, no, he, he just also, wants respect. He wants yeah, to wear big boy pants he's and be able to tell him how fancy career. he looks. Yeah, he doesn't care yeah. about anything else. Uh, yeah. He's also not very interested. Another thing that happens during this period is Germany, you know, they're unable to pay back their war debts. They like strike in terms of war debt repayment. And the French military occupies the Ruhr, which is Germany's mm-hmm. industrial heartland. This is a huge deal for the right wing. This is like a major, this is like fucking... Benghazi for them, right? Like, yeah, this is, yeah, like yeah. they they go to they 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 are obsessed with this fucking deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and Reinhard doesn't care about it either, uh, because again, mm. he's just not a political guy. His yeah. comrades in the navy actually considered him a liberal, and a lot of them d- disliked him for that reason. Years later, his wife Lena would claim that at this stage, quote, politically he was clueless. He regarded all parties, particularly the Nazi Party, with arrogance and considered politics itself to be vulgar. In this connection, he acted very much the snob and regarded his naval career as the most important thing. The rest didn't matter. 
I, I just I love that he was apolitical because it's like uh, it just, uh, you know, it proves to me that like whenever someone gets goes from apolitical to immediately radicalized, yeah. it's like, nah, you have no ideology. You have no political beliefs. Your, your radicalization is absolutely dependent on just positive reinforcement. So, like, you know, it's it's it, this isn't a deeply held belief that he's had for years and years it's totally saw which way the wind was blowing and is pretending to have always been down for his fucking right wing revolution yep yep and it's yeah. i mean we'll, we'll talk about that too in a bit because i think there is there is some more to it but mm. at this period of time again his 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 enlisted navy comrades consider him like an effete liberal yeah. Um, he's not super popular among his fellow comrades and his unpopularity in among them kind of brings a resurgence of the rumors that he was Jewish. One fellow mm. officer cadet later recalled Heydrich was more or less regarded as a Jew because another crew comrade from Halle told us that his family was actually called Sus and that this was widely known in, in Halle. This is like, that's where the rumors come from is that one of his relatives had a last name that was also a Jewish last name. Yeah. Um, so Heydrich earned the teasing nicknames White Jew and White Moses. And in order to fight back <laughs> against those rumors, Heydrich starts trying to claim that he's super anti-Semitic. And he starts claiming that he'd been a member of a bunch of anti-Semitic organizations before joining the Navy. Um, again, probably untrue. He starts lying about this to counteract the rumors. Right, um, right. But also, this is kind of the period in which his his commitment to, number one this is the period in which political anti-semitism is going viral in germany and mm -hmm. heydrich is kind of along for the ride and he's in part inspired by the fact that it behooves him politically to be as anti-semitic as possible yeah now yeah yeah Despite all the difficulties he had with his crewmates, Reinhardt was a solid naval officer. His career moved steadily upward. In the summer of 1923, he was transferred to a cruiser where he met Wilhelm Canaris, the future head of Nazi Germany's military intelligence agency. Canaris was impressed by the young officer and became his mentor. By 1924, Heydrich had found his groove. He excelled as a Navy man, and he even begun to find respect within a certain set of the officer cast. Many of these men appreciated his artistic talents and noted that he seemed completely transformed when he would start playing the violin or discussing music. People will say that his, his violin playing brings folks to tears. Like, he's wow. supposed to be very good. Yeah, he's got to be good. Um, in 1926, he was promoted to second Naval Lieutenant. His roommate reported that after this, he, quote, developed significantly. His superior frequently gave him recognition and good evaluations. He was obliging and showed that people could rely on him. With every sign of recognition, his zeal increased, and so did his arrogance. Ambition was undoubtedly Heydrich's strongest characteristic. He wanted to accomplish something, and others were supposed to be amazed. Now, Heydrich began to dream of one day becoming an admiral. In 1928, he was promoted to first lieutenant. This brought him more free time, which he devoted to athletics, music, and women. He had been noted by his colleagues as having a wandering eye. In 1926, mm. when aboard the Schleswig, the Schleswig Holstein, which is a, a boat with a terrible name. Horrible mm -hmm. name. <laughs> yeah, horrible name. Uh -huh. uh, on a journey through Spain and Portugal, he gained a reputation for sleeping around with absolutely anything in a skirt. Uh, yeah. women he I'm looking for I'm looking for a Holstein to fucking yeah. Schleswig. I would like a Holstein for my uh, yeah. Schleswig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All these uh, Holsteins on the boats. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so not just ladies he meets in bars, but ladies he meets in brothels. Uh, and there's even one point where there's like a joint naval social gathering with like the German and British navies. And he starts really awkwardly, probably drunkenly, hitting on a British officer's wife. Um, and she like turns him down very publicly in a way that's super embarrassing. Yeah. So Heydrich had no issue engaging in casual liaisons with sex workers, but his real goal was to find a high class woman with social status that he could show off at fancy parties. Because again, mm -hmm. he's an image yeah. guy. Yeah. On December 6th, 1930, he met Lina van Austin at a ball. Now, when you run into Germans with a Vaughn between their first and last names, it means they're either a grifter pretending to be a noble or they have some sort of noble heritage. Lina's yeah. father was descended from Danish nobility, but the von Austin fortunes had fallen since the 1860s. So they're they're the aristocrat the aristocracy, but they're also broke. They're broker than the Heydrich family by the 1920s. Lena is still upper class though, because again, class isn't something that has just to do with money. It's about your right. breeding. So she's high bred but broke. Um, yeah. And she and Heydrich fall for each other. 
three days after their first date, Reinhard Heydrich sends, invites Lena to the theater and then to a wine bar where he proposes to her. She eventually succe- accepts. And to try and understand why she accepts, I'm going to cite a passage from the book Nazi Wives. Quote, Lena found him intriguing. I felt sympathy for this purposeful yet reserved young man and agreed to a rendezvous the next day. In her memoirs, she breathlessly described how Heydrich opened his heart to her over a series of long walks, a visit to the theater, and a meal in a restaurant, and then asked her to marry him during their third evening together. Lena liked to suggest that their love was written in the stars and could not be denied. Others have speculated that his sudden proposal was a necessary prelude to getting her in bed. Um, <laughs> you know. That's game, dude. Just yeah. like going dude's straight. Rock. <laughs> yeah, dude's rock, dude. You just... You wine them and dine them for three dates, and then you go, hey, uh, would you fuck me if yeah. I married you? Come yeah, on. Would, you, would you fuck me if we get engaged? <laughs> yeah, now you will. Oh, man. So then, I, that, that's also at a time when I think like three dates, if you didn't ask someone to marry you by then, yeah. uh, you were just being a harlot if you yeah. did not marry them. <laughs> yeah, your d- dating is, yeah, it's, it, was a, it was a different time. It's a different time, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was a different time. Um, yeah. But you I know what time it is now, you. guys. But oh. you know who will break. fuck you on the third yeah. date without getting oh, married. Oh, no. No. Yeah. No, no, Sophie, that's the way it is. That's true. All right. uh-huh. Can I at least... I'm hoping for dick pill ads. That's all oh, I'm saying. I, I, whether or not they're dick pill ads, the one promise we make on this show, the only promise we make about our sponsors is that they all fuck. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fuck. Yeah. Like, <laughs> these products, fuck. Fuck. Here's another Volkswagen ad. <laughs> I mean, if you ain't got laid in the back of a Beetle, like, yeah. what are you doing? What did you do yeah. with your twenties? The 2021 Volkswagen by VW. By VW, no race mm-hmm. mixing. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Oh, good times. So. They keep their engagement secret at first um, because Reinhardt has to get the family's approval, right? You don't like legally, you don't have to, I don't think in this period, right, but, but it's, it's like, polite. and it's polite. Yeah. And also he's, he's comes from a high class family. They're rich as hell. They're not nobles, but they're very wealthy. They run in high class circles. She's a noble. You want to do things properly. Sure. Um, so they get engaged in secret, but he promises her that he's going to get her family's approval before Christmas. He just kind of wants to get all his ducks in a row, make himself look as impressive as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, he writes her a letter shortly after their engagement that ends with this paragraph. Quote, being straightforward and upright is the key demand I have always placed upon myself. It will thus not be difficult for me to look your father in the eye. You know, for me, there is nothing worse in people whom I love than beating around the bush in insincerity. I don't hesitate to confront mean guys with the same weapons. <laughs> now, of course he was lying Mean to her. guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder, like, that's how it's translated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he was lying to her. He was not lying yes. about wanting to be married, because they did get married. He was lying to her about being a sincere and straightforward man. The yep. truth is that Reinhard Heydrich was a habitual liar when it came to sex, and pretty much everything else. Yes. Uh, he was already involved with another woman. In fact, he had gotten involved with another woman six months before he met Lena. We do not know the precise details of the story, but one of a couple of different things has to be true. Either he forced himself, slash, you know, raped a woman, and then promised to marry her afterwards to keep her quiet and you know i'm putting the words rape in there but at the time you you might not have, like she might not have of described it that way right because people talked differently about it at that point She's sure like, well, we fucked and like consent's not a thing in my culture but you have to marry me now right that's one right. possibility yeah um the other possibility is that he started sleeping with a woman uh, and he had to claim that they to get he had to promise to get engaged to her so that they could keep fucking right. They fuck mm. once and she's like, well, OK, we got to get I, I You got you can't make me a dishonest woman like we have right. to get married now because we fucked. One yeah. of those two things is true. Robert Gerwath. And I, I tend to he knows more about Reinhard Heydrich than I do. His take on this is you'll hear a couple of different ones. His take is that Heydrich met this woman six months earlier at another bar and that this young woman just kind of assumed that she and Heydrich were engaged because they were fucking. So maybe he didn't even promise to get engaged, but because of where things culturally are at the time. Oh, we fucked. We're engaged now. That's yeah, what this yeah, means. Yeah. I yeah, don't know yeah. what the case is. Yeah. Whatever the truth, Reinhard did follow through on his promise to tell Lena's family. 
Uh, they approved um, because he was a young rising naval star with a semi-famous father. Um, so they start printing engagements announcements for the local paper to celebrate. And the woman that he's having sex with on the side sees one of these engagement announcements. Uh-oh. And she is not happy about this. <laughs> I'm going to quote from Hitler's hangman again. Reinhard, who continued to cultivate the relationship even after he had met Lena, invited her, the second woman, to Kiel, where he's stationed, and despite her request for a separate room in a hotel, encouraged her to spend the night in his living quarters. Further rapprochement probably occurred on this occasion. In any case, the young woman saw herself as compromised and reacted to the receipt of Heydrich's engagement notice with a nervous breakdown. Now, we don't know who this lady was, but we do know that her father was some kind of prominent person in Germany because he was directly connected to the commander in chief of the entire German Navy, which Uh is a bad family to piss off if you're wanting a Navy career. Uh, Yeah, in the Navy. Yeah, yeah, in the Navy. So Heydrich gets court-martialed over this, um, and it's because it's dishonorable behavior, right? Honor is a big thing. This is like scummy behavior. You can get in trouble for this. And most sources, including Gerwath, seem to agree that normally he would have just gotten kind of a a little more than a slap on the wrist, but it wouldn't have ended or even derailed his career, right? Right. Because again, it's what it's fucking like all of these rich dudes are sleeping around, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're all doing Um, it. So he would have, yeah, probably he would have just, if he, if he had, as soon as they brought him in, been like, yes, you know, I'm just a man. I fucked up. Uh, yeah. This is my bad. I'm so yeah. sorry. He who gotten, among us? Who am I, who's not- among <laughs> us? Uh, and all the other dudes have been like, yeah, you know what? We're all rich Navy officers. A hundred percent of us are cheating on our wives and mm-hmm, we're cheating yeah. on our mistresses. Okay. Right. Like he yeah. would have gotten a punishment in order to mollify the, the, the father of this woman and it would have gone away. But that's not how it goes, because Heydrich cannot take responsibility for his own actions. So instead, he tries to blame everything on the woman for seducing him. Wow. Uh, dis- yeah. <laughs> and a- again, you're talking about one of the most patriarchal misogynist cultures in history, Germany. Yeah. And this, the German Navy in the early yeah. 1920s. <laughs> his behavior is so gross that it horrifies all of these admirals. Right. Wow. Like you and and that's difficult in this yeah, period for yeah, you to be too yeah. misogynist for like the admirals of the German Navy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, they saw they saw like thousands of people dying like yeah. uh, on the on the Rhine. Yeah. And they're just like, you disgust me. You, but not you, Reinhardt. Yeah. Not you. Wow. So you. his general sliminess is so upsetting to them that they decide he is not fit to wear a German uniform and he is Damn. discharged from the Navy. Um you have Man. to you have to really think in your head how gross you have to be for all these guys. Again, I can't overemphasize this. All these guys in the twenties going like, this dude's kind of anti woman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I beat my wife and my girlfriend every day, but this guy seems to really. I don't hate, hate them. <laughs> yeah, I hit them because I love them. He's just a meanie. Yeah, what a mean man. So. This fucks up all of Reinhard Heydrich's plans. Oddly yeah. enough, his Lena, his fiance, stays with him. This might sound odd if you don't understand the fact that, and this is a rarity for the show, Lena Van Austin, Reinhard Heydrich's wife, sucks as much as he does. She's like, she's a mm. terrible person. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I don't say that lightly. Normally, I try to have, because it's a hard time. Women don't have a lot of, aren't granted sure. a lot of agency by the society in this period. Mm-hmm. She's really bad. She's a yeah. really bad person. In the, and, and not just because she stays with, like, not because she stays with her husband during, or uh, Reinhardt during this, but for a lot of other reasons. Yeah, in she sounds book, independently bad. She's independently it, so. shitty. Yeah. Wow. In the book Nazi Wives, James Wiley writes, quote, Beyond the powerful physical attraction between them, Lena and Heydrich shared some key characteristics. Both were fixed on escaping their backgrounds and forging a different destiny for themselves. They were stubborn and extremely ambitious. Each had a cold, calculating streak. Neither suffered fools gladly. Both had an inflated sense of their own worth and felt that the majority of people were inferior beings. So... Real power couple of being trash. Yeah, yeah. just sitting around in the living room going... I fucking hate the Italians. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, you know who I don't like? West <laughs> Prussians. <laughs> <laughs> just the whole vest of Prussia is yeah. just gross to it's me. It's Polish is what it is. Yeah. It's just, ugh. So, Let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> is this love? <laughs> <laughs> they're both like looking like, they're like at a museum touching a phrenological, like, like one of those heads with a bunch yeah. of bumps on it to yeah. tell you like, and like, 
their yeah. hands meet in the middle at the lobe <laughs> that like, like lady in the tramp is Simoy Simonite yeah. or whatever. <laughs> they, they phrased we it. were both about to measure the same skull <laughs> and then our hands met. <laughs> so you've surely heard the phrase behind every man is a great woman. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. this is also true of history's greatest monsters. Had yeah. Lena not been the sort of woman she was, we might not have had a Reinhard Heydrich because he might have killed himself after getting discharged from the Navy. And mm-hmm. I'm going to quote again uh, from from Wiley's book, uh, uh, fucking Nazi Wives. Quote, mm-hmm. on 30th April 1931, he was dismissed from the Navy. Lena said that he was so shattered by the verdict that he had a total breakdown, locking himself in his room for days on end, smashing furniture and weeping uncontrollably. And she had to piece him back together again. Whether true or not, and it's hard to imagine the man Hitler called Iron Heart behaving like a hysterical child. The most startling thing about the whole incident is Lena's unswerving loyalty. Under the circumstances, nobody would have blamed her if she'd called off the engagement. She was only yeah. 19, so this was hardly her last chance at happiness. Clearly, Lena was convinced that with her guidance, Heydrich would, could, could still rise to the top. I can fix him. I can fix him. I can... Yeah. I can make him powerful and that will yeah. make me famous and powerful. I can yeah. make him so much worse. Yeah. yeah. Now the Vaughn Austin family rescinded their approval for the marriage after Heydrich got fired. This was not like necessarily a moral thing. It was a pragmatic thing. The family is sure. broke and they needed to know that Heydrich was going to have money before they would accept this. Right. Lena right. seems to have considered it her duty to make sure her husband to be got the chance to be as great as she knew he could be. She was convinced his chance would come through the national socialist German workers party. While Heydrich was fairly apolitical in 1930, when they met, Lena was already a dedicated Nazi. She had first attended a party rally the year before, where she'd swooned over the sexy black uniformed men of Hitler's new bodyguard unit, the SS, or Schutzstaffel. (laughs) Now, when she met Heydrich, her only disappointment with him came from the fact that he had never even heard of Hitler's Mein Kampf. In fact, he mocked Nazi leaders regularly, calling Hitler a bohemian corporal and Goebbels a cripple. Again, he's racist <laughs> against the Nazi leadership. Hitler's an Austrian, that piece of shit. <laughs> like, they're and basically guy, slobs. <laughs> and this guy's got funny legs. Yeah. I like is a cripple. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, first off, so was the Kaiser. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Your beloved Kaiser. He might too. not have known. They kept that pretty under wraps. So that's true. Lena's brother was a committed Nazi, a member of 1929, since 1929 of the SA or the Stormtroopers. He was one of the mm-hmm. first 100,000 Nazis. Yeah. Um, her whole family, as embarrassed and, impo- and impoverished aristocrats, appreciated the Nazi message of German rebirth. Lena particularly appreciated their racism. Decades after the war, in the 1970s, she admitted to interviewers that as a teenager, she'd come to view Polish refugees who entered Germany in 1918 as, quote, intruders and unwelcome guests. Their presence provoked her so much that she had to hate them yeah yeah yeah. it was their fault she made her hate them by not looking like her Um, yeah yeah. she compared seeing refugees who'd fled to germany to avoid massacre as a forced marriage they're raping me with their presence basically is what she says (laughs) like Like, that's again she's trash she's really bad yeah yeah and again sorry she is trash and she is canceled she is a big driving factor in heydrich's developing anti-semitism because it really hits warp speed once he meets lena i think she kind of drives his racism in a lot of ways she certainly drives him towards the nazi party yeah and so Lena advised her beau to join the Nazis and offer his services to the SA. Again, the SA are the brown shirts. These are the street right. fighting Nazis. And at this point, they have about 150,000 members. They're kind of creating a parallel military to the German military, the Reichswehr. And as a result, they're actively recruiting former military officers whose experience could help the SA's leader, a fellow named Ernst Rome, turn the organization into a real military. Now, it's important to note that the Nazis are not Heydrich's only path to avoid destitution. These are, this is not his only choice after the Navy. He gets offered a cushy, well-paying job teaching sailing that would have paid him more, honestly, than he'd made in the Navy, but he wouldn't have had respect. Sailing teachers don't get uniforms. They don't get ranks, right? Yeah, yeah. Nazis do. Those those who can't do teach, you know, and he's just like, I'm not going to I'm not going to go down that road. <laughs> yeah. No one gets Meanwhile, less respect than a teacher. I love that. That just is yeah. a universal concept. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing's worse than being a teacher. I'm going to join the Nazi party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, meanwhile, the Nazis, cognizant of Reinhardt's experience as an officer, offered him an elevated position within their organization, one on the staff of a little dude you might have heard of named Heinrich Himmler. 
Now, at the time, Himmler had newly been put in charge of the SS. And the SS, again, the SS stands basically for bodyguard. It's like protection squad, I think is the literal translation. These are, they start just as a small group of the most loyal and also most like an Aryan looking Nazis to guard Hitler's body, right? Yeah. They become a state within a state. There's eventually like a million or so of these guys. Um, At the time, there's very few SS men. They're subordinate to the SA, so they're not independent. But Himmler's in charge of them, and he has a dream to supplant the SA, to make them the biggest Mm -hmm. thing in being a Nazi. Uh, Now, his first step to doing this was to increase the party's capacity to carry out counter-espionage, because both anti-fascists and the German police are infiltrating the Nazis and the SA at this point. Um, So Himmler, his first vision is like, okay, what are we bad at? We're bad at rooting out spies. So that's one of the things I'm going to have the SS do. I'm going to build a capacity for counter espionage into it. And he needs a guy to lead this because he doesn't know anything about counter espionage. And the friend of Reinhard Heydrich's family who, and of Lena's family, who basically comes to the Nazis and say, hey, I know this officer who wants to join if you'll offer him a cushy job. He claims that Heydrich is an ex-naval intelligence officer. This is not true. It's It came out as a result of kind of like a miscommunication. He was in like signals intelligence, but he doesn't know anything about espionage. But right. Heydrich gets the interview anyway. He immediately impressed Himmler, who saw in his his new SS, like he, Himmler wants the SS to be the racial elite of the Nazi party. And so from the beginning, there were strict requirements for genealogy. They would reject mainly on appearance if you had like an inferior body, which it's funny because if you look at Heinrich Himmler, he looks like an extra from Trekkies. Um, yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, right Hard Heydrich, though, like it makes sense that Himmler falls in love with this dude. Heydrich yeah. is tall. He's over six feet. He's athletic. He's in very good shape. He's blonde haired and blue eyed. Right. Yeah. Um, he's he gets the played by Aaron. Kenneth Branagh. He gets you know? played by Ken- played ably by Kenneth Branagh. Yeah, 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 very well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's clear that I, I yeah. love that the whole Nazi leadership are just the most fugly fucking ghouls you've ever seen. And all of their propaganda is just like, we are the most beautiful people on earth. We have yeah. the blonde hair <laughs> and uh, we never bald. We never get fat. <laughs> you just look at like Martin Borman and you're just like, what uh, the fuck? <laughs> yeah, fucking janky ass Martin Borman. Hitler with his <laughs> with his screwed up intestines shitting himself constantly. <laughs> like all these the most fucking sickly. Herman Goering horribly addicted to heroin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just the most sickly, flawed, disgusting people just being like, you know what we are? We're hot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like, look, hey, we're all, we all have IBS and drug abuse yeah. problems. We just don't yeah. pretend not to. And yeah, try yeah, to create yeah. a fake racial hierarchy that murders uh, uh, other people who basically, yeah, it, anyway. Yeah. I, I know, I know what my, my features look like, you yeah. know, and I, I say, rather than being like, no, I have a small nose. I'm like, nah, big noses are sexy. This yeah. is, this is what I look like. So yeah. anyway, I, Himmler loves Heydrich cause he's, he's a fucking sexy ass blonde haired, yeah. blue eyed dude. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Himmler's thrilled with his appearance, of course, but that mm-hmm. didn't necessarily mean he was going to get the job because uh, Himmler's hiring for a specific technical task. He wants someone to build a counter espionage agency. Yeah. Um, Heydrich has no experience in this. And to explain how he gets the job anyway, I'm going to quote again from Hitler's hangman. Undeterred by the realization that the applicant in front of him lacked any previous qualification for espionage work, Himmler asked Heydrich to sketch out an organizational plan for an SS intelligence agency and gave him 20 minutes to complete the task. Without any previous experience in the field of espionage, Heydrich resorted to the minimal knowledge he gained from years of reading cheap crime fiction and spy novels and wrapped his (laughs) suggestions for a future SS intelligence service in suitably military phraseology. His minimal knowledge of espionage appears to have (laughs) surpassed that of Himmler. The Reich leader SS was impressed and hired him in preference to a second applicant, a former police captain. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> let's, okay, let's do uh, pros and cons. Pro, he's a police captain. Yeah. Con, he's not as hot. <laughs> yeah, and. Yeah. He hasn't read every Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So we're going with the hot So guy. Mr. Heydrich, you're saying we need to be doing more heroin. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you're saying more heroin and you're saying we need like a little fat man who will yeah. also help us out named Watson. I love it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh man. Now, the horrible historic irony here is that in in picking Heydrich over this police captain, he actually made an excellent decision for a dumb reason, but this police captain turned out to also be an undercover cop trying to infiltrate the SS for oh, the police. Oh shit, yeah. accidental like, good he decision. He actually makes the best of the two decisions just for the <laughs> dumbest possible reason. <laughs> Damn it. And it's funny, uh, we talk about this in one of our very first Behind the Bastards episodes, like the influence that like shitty fiction has on the Nazis. Hitler yeah. is hugely influenced by like a con man and cowboy novelist uh, who wrote, writes like these, yeah. these like fantasy cowboy novels about like, you know, yeah. Native Americans and, and, yeah. and German cowboys and shit. Uh, Carl! Yeah, and, and, and it's funny because like, Heydrich gets hired to basically run the SS secret police because of his knowledge of these these fantasy detective novels. Yeah. During World War II, during the, the Russian War, when like things are going badly for the Nazis, Hitler sends hundreds of copies of these shitty cowboy novels to his generals on the Eastern Front because he's certain that they're filled with like strategic insights. Like I can't <laughs> overestimate the degree to which these guys are just a bunch of fucking nerds. It's the the nerdiest fucking fools i swear yeah. to god <laughs> just like fucking really like okay i have read every tom clancy yeah and I, am, I i think i can run counterterrorism. <laughs> like, i am certain that like when our fascist takes over and invades i don't know fucking china uh yeah. and the war goes badly they're going to start like mailing copies of r.a salvatore novels to their generals yes. like <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, fucking hell. Man. So, god damn it. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, Heydrich gets hired by Himmler, and his starting salary isn't a lot of money, but when combined with the money he was still receiving from the Navy after getting fired, um, Heydrich was now making a, a modest income, enough to support he and his wife to be. Now, Heydrich seems to have had something of an instinct for party politics. He's good at this job. He's good at the politicking part of this job. We can debate how good he is at counterespionage, but he's good at making a place for himself in an organization and consistently expanding that place. Yeah. He recognizes Himmler early on as a guy he should tie himself to, and he sets about mimicking every opinion and deeply held belief his boss expresses. He also dives into proving himself as a Nazi. Now, the best way to do this in the early 1930s is to get into a bunch of street fights with communists and social democrats. During the run-up to the 1931 Hamburg elections, the Nazis sent small motorized SS units around to assault left-wing party gatherings, and they were in cars so they could disappear before the cops would arrive. Heydrich leads one of these squads. He's good at this job. Um, and his shock troop actually gets a reputation for being particularly brutal. Hamburg communists start calling him the blonde beast. Yeah. So he's, he's, yeah. he's, he, he, this is how he really proves himself to the other Nazis. You got to crack some fucking skulls in this period. Yeah. Now, yeah. Reinhardt also knows that one of the best ways to make yourself valuable in a new organization is to find something it's not doing, but it needs to do, and then create that thing. For the SS, this is the... I'm not even going to try it. The security service hereafter referred to as the SD. This is yeah. the SS intelligence branch that Himmler had been wanting to make for a while. Heydrich jumps on the task and it starts off at the beginning. Heydrich is the only man in the SD. The organization is just him. And eventually mm -hmm. this will, this will be tens of thousands of guys. So like, that's kind of the, uh, how he grows this, like yeah. to himself alone in a room to yeah. the, the head of security, basically for all of Nazi Germany. Um, now, again, he's uh, it's a pretty humble position at the time in reality, but the fact that he's the head of something makes him sound impressive enough that he's able to write to Lena's parents and ask for their blessing to go forward with the wedding. And eventually yeah. they say yes. Heydrich also impressed his new Nazi colleagues. His first big task was to convince his superiors to give him the funding to put together a group of SS men who could unmask sm spies within the organization. This strike force would be able to act quickly to get rid of threats. He had, in effect, created the first Nazi secret police, a fact that was discovered by a local newspaper, which described it as a fascist Cheka, which is like, that's the, the Soviet secret police. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, the article named Heydrich as the brains of the operation. So he's, he starts to be known for what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. He's getting ink spilled about yeah, him. He's getting like some ink are, spilled, which means, yeah. you know, maybe he's not actually all that great at the secret part, but he's right. good at being in a party. <laughs> yeah. At the end of 1931, he had more than 50 officers in his SD. The Von Austin family finally gives him their approval, and in December of that year, he and Lena are wed. Now, at the time they got hitched, the SS and the SA were briefly illegal as the result of a temporary crackdown by one of the Weimar government's, like, last 
independent-ish kind of leaders before Hitler's rise. Despite mm. this, the Heydrich's wedding was conducted in uniform. Here's how Lena described her husband's wedding in a letter to a family member. The SA and SS, dressed in white shirts and black trousers, formed a guard of honor all the way to the cemetery gate. The pastor was also on our side and gave us a Luther quotation as a wedding motto. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. As we marched <sighs> out of the church, the organist played the horse vessel song. As we left the cemetery following the wedding, several guards of honor were arrested by the police. So... <laughs> That's the Heydrich wedding. Very Nazi wedding. Very Nazi. I mean, you've got everything. You've got people dressed up all all goth and mm -hmm. shit. You've got a fucking. Uh, it's they got married at a church with a cemetery in it. Yep. I mean, these guys were really going for it, like fucking style wise. Yep. Nice. As a reward for his hard work and for getting married, Himmler promoted Reinhard Heydrich to SS Sturmbannführer or Major. This was just yeah. seven days after his last promotion. The happy couple moved in together, but they did not spend much time enjoying themselves. Heydrich was a workaholic, constantly mm -hmm. at his desk or out in the street fighting for the party. His work ethic only somewhat compensated for the fact that he had no experience doing the kind of job that he'd gotten for himself. Robert yeah. Gerwath writes, The need for reforms to Heydrich's still highly amateurish spy network in Germany became apparent in February 1932, when the SD suddenly found itself in a crisis prompted by the arrest of one of Heydrich's agents, who had tried to gather secret military information from Navy Command and Wilhelm Schaben. And although the police investigation did not reveal Heydrich's involvement in the case, he nevertheless recognized the need to restructure his intelligence service in order to avoid further embarrassment. And he, he restructures it in a way that seems to be fairly effective. By June of 1932, Heydrich's SD was the best intelligence gathering operation in the Nazi party. Its competition, mm. which had been the SA intelligence division, is actually shut down because his, SS intelli his SD makes it unnecessary. Heydrich gets promoted yet again, this time to colonel. And now he has eight full-time employees. Um, you know, things kind of go up and down for the Nazis in this period. There's some dark times in late 1932 when they get mm. kind of beamed in an election. But yeah. by this point, Hitler was adjacent to power. And, you know, they, he orchestrates his way into power by 1933. And he and his comrades right. succeed in seizing control of the Weimar government through a trail of fuckery that we detail in our non-Nazi bastards behind Hitler episode. Reinhard Heydrich was not a major player in the Nazi seizure of power. By the time Hitler wound up in control, he had established himself as the chief of the Nazi secret police. Now, that had been an inter-party secret police, but now the party was the government, and Reinhard Heydrich was about to find himself in near total control of the German police. We're going to talk about that and what came after in part two. But you know what we're going to talk about right now, Matt? What? Yeah. Your pluggables. Plug, plug, oh. plug. Uh, plugs, plugs, plugs. Oh, man, I got so much to plug. Well, if you love uh, talking about uh the real bad nazis uh you're also going to love the hbo series the sopranos and if you if you love the sopranos check out pod yourself a gun that's a podcast that me and vince mancini do uh it's like a sopranos rewatch re podcast uh we also do a movie podcast called the fraught cast f r o t c a s t check that out that's about not the sopranos it's about movies and stuff yeah uh, and yeah follow me on instagram at matt lieb jokes it's At Matt Lieb jokes. All right. Yeah. Well, friendos and enemies, frenemies. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, enemies listen to this podcast. A lot of sure. enemies listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Shout yeah. out to Reinhard Heydrich, fan of the pod. Uh, fan of the pod, loves it. From hell on his Zune. <laughs> <laughs> Love you so evil. He has a Zune. Yeah, I know. That was Zune a, energy. That was a great detail. <laughs> <laughs> the level of evil that we can't even fathom. Yeah. <laughs> Hitler's there on like an iPod original being like, right, come on, right, man. Exactly. <laughs> what are you doing? I've got to zoom. Is I'm it the inferior most technology? <laughs> <laughs> it All runs right. on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love this Hitler as a Microsoft chauvinist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the big split in the Nazi party in hell is between like the, the <laughs> Microsoft and then like the Strasserites who go for Linux. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You know I've got Nazis, a diamond reel. A joke. <laughs> it only holds 12 songs and that's all you need. Anything more is vanity. <laughs> <laughs> Best MP3 player on the market. <laughs> all right. Well, that's the yeah. end of the episode. We'll be back on Thursday to just a lot of genocide coming on Thursday. 
very fun. All right. Bam. 